Welcome to Australia's Future with Tony Abbott. I'm Daniel Wilde from the Institute of Public Affairs. Australia is facing its most significant challenges since World War II. Geopolitical tensions are increasing. Cultural self-confidence is in decline. The values which define us, freedom, democracy, egalitarianism and sacrifice are being put to the test. Over this special podcast series, Tony and I discuss how Australia can survive and flourish in the decades ahead. Hello, Tony, and g'day to all of our listeners. Wonderful to be with you for what will be our final episode for 2022, and we're very grateful for all of the analysis and guidance that uh, Tony has given us over the year. Uh, But we're going to finish on a high note with uh, much to talk about. Uh, We're going to kick off today, Tony, by talking about the latest developments in the voice uh, debate. And what I'd like to start with is a bill that was put into the House Uh, last week regarding um, essentially administrative changes, if you like, to the way in which the the referendum will be run. Uh, It's called the Referendum Machinery Provisions Amendment Bill 2022. Uh, It covers a range of topics, but there's two key um, areas that I wanted to bring up with you. The first is what the bill will do is uh, lift a funding restriction to enable uh, the government to fund so-called education initiatives to counter misinformation. And the second is to remove the requirement for a pamphlet detailing both the yes and the no case to be posted to each household. Uh, Tony, from my view, this is another example of how the government is uh, trying to stack the deck, uh, limiting the ability of the no case to get its case out Uh, to the general public, knowing full well that the yes case has the government, big tech and big corporates behind it. Uh, Tony, what's your assessment? Well, I think your assessment is uh, essentially correct, Dan. And obviously, if the voice is to be stopped, and I think it should be, and I certainly hope that it will be, it's going to be a people's campaign that stops it, uh, not a campaign that's got uh, massive resources mobilised behind it. Um, I do think that there's every indication from the government uh, that uh, it is uh, going to be a very one-sided effort, (laughs) which is funded by taxpayers whether they like it or not. Um, I think it's a real pity that the traditional pamphlet uh, that has always gone out uh, for every referendum where MPs in favour of the yes case uh, and MPs in favour of the no case uh, summarise the arguments uh, uh, that they want to put forward, and that goes out uh, by post to every every uh, household. I think it's a real pity that that isn't continuing because I think that's an important sign of the even-handedness of our democracy. I also think it's a real worry that the government has committed itself not just to tax deductibility for pro-voice uh, organisations, uh, for donations to pro-voice organisations, but it's committed itself uh, to funding a campaign against so-called misinformation. Well, um, based on uh, what we've had from voice supporters, uh, anyone who's against the voice is guilty of misinformation. Uh, Therefore, there's going to be a government-funded campaign against the voice. Um, uh, But certainly, uh, there'll be no even-handedness with equal funding uh, for people who want to see the Constitution not changed. So, look... um, I think it's a. I think it's a bit of a worry, frankly. Uh, I think we're seeing uh, a lot of big brother tendencies in government these days, and I don't know whether it's a carryover from the authoritarianism uh, of the uh, lockdown period. I don't know whether it's a carryover from this sudden view that we can't debate issues; we've got to listen to so-called experts and defer to them on everything. Uh, but. Uh, it doesn't augur well, and that's why it's so important that we've got uh, organisations like the IPA and things like this podcast Mm. to try to give people an alternative view, which hopefully is uh, fair, uh, well-argued, and as dispassionate as we can be, given that in the end you do have to come down on one side or another for these issues. Yeah, that's right. Look, just with the pamphlet, you know, the argument the government's making is, oh, well, you know, we're in the digital age mm. now. We don't need to have a pamphlet. But that ignores a couple of things. One is a lot of the elderly are not active on the internet and they're not going to find the information. So, firstly, I think it's um, 
it's going to have a disproportionate effect on the elderly who are probably more likely to vote no. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's deliberate on their behalf. But secondly, it's, uh, as you say, about balance, about ensuring that, well, at a minimum, every single household will have the basic information of of both cases, as was the case with the Republic referendum. Mm -hmm. So um, I I share your concerns about that. I just want to talk about the misinformation. So uh, this morning, uh, Professor Professor Marsha Langdon has, I think, let the mask clip a little bit on on the way that this debate is going to go. Uh, she said, as reported in The Australian, uh, she is disappointed the Nationals have, quote, injected misinformation and vitriol, end quote, into the discussion on The Voice, uh, calling out Senator Jacinta Price for, quote, nasty eugenicist, end quote, debate. This sounds a bit unhinged uh, and I think uh, showing a, a lack of just common courtesy. Well, that's right. <clears throat> Look, I, I listened to uh, Senator Price uh, on the day the National Party announced their position and from what I could work out, she made essentially two points. She said, first of all, that she didn't think Australians should be divided by race in our founding document and I think that's a perfectly reasonable point to make. Second point she made is that she didn't think this voice was going to do much to help the difficulties of Indigenous people in remote Australia. And again, I think that's a reasonable point to make because um, inevitably this voice is going to be taken over by the activists from the big cities. Uh, um, While the real problems in Indigenous Australia are in remote areas, the majority of Indigenous people do actually live in our cities and so it'll be urban Indigenous, many of whom are living... uh, a pretty normal, in inverted commas, life, uh, they're going to have the predominant voice here. So I don't think the voice is going to tackle the sorts of issues which we see uh, so tragically in so much of remote Australia. Um, I think we do need to get to the heart of all of that. And as I've been saying for years, the basic problem in these places is the kids don't go to school, the adults don't go to work, and the ordinary law of the land is not enforced. So we do need to tackle these, but uh, I think the voice is far more likely to perpetuate Mm. um, lefty stereotypes about colonial oppression and dispossession and so on than it is to actually tackle the practical problems uh, in real people's lives. The other issue with the voice is... uh, it's inevitably uh, going to gum up the workings of government and it is inevitably going to become uh, a big step towards the kind of co-governance systems that they're trying to evolve in New Zealand or Aotearoa as we're now being encouraged to call it. Now, again, I just think this is a, this is a very big mistake, a very, very big mistake and that's why It's important that before Australians decide this critical step uh, for our country, that there is a very vigorous debate. (laughs) And yet the government, to go back to your first question, Dan, seems to want to suppress debate on one side. Uh, You're quite right. And on the matter of the challenges in remote communities, you speak with some authority given that you've spent a a decent amount of time in in those communities and you've seen the challenges there firsthand. Exactly right. And look, I I don't claim any uh, special virtue here. I don't claim to be any particular expert, but I certainly did think that if uh, members of parliament and ministers in governments are going to uh, deal more effectively with these issues, uh, we'll never be perfect, but deal more effectively with these issues, It wasn't good enough just to read briefing papers and to have discussions with the bureaucrats in Canberra. You needed to try as far as was possible to see things on the ground. And that's why for most of my time in Parliament, I tried to spend a lot of time in remote Australia. Mm. And as party leader and then as Prime Minister, um, I tried to spend at least a week, a year uh, in Indigenous Australia. I mean, Indigenous people are what, 4% of the population, more or less. I figured if I spent uh, uh, one week or uh, roughly 2% of my time in Indigenous Australia, that would at least be a reasonable way of trying to acknowledge, A, Indigenous people, pay proper respect to them, and B, get the best possible grasp on the issues. And as I said, the big problem in these places 
It's not that we don't spend money. It's not that we aren't concerned. It's that so much of our money spending is counterproductive mm. and so much of our concern is in the end misdirected because it doesn't address the practical problems. And the practical problems are, as I say, over and over again, the kids don't go to school, the adults, adults don't go to work, and the ordinary law of the land isn't enforced. Now, Ian Trust, who I very much respect and admire, had an, had a, an interesting piece in the Australian uh, uh, this week where he talked about exactly these problems. He concluded his piece by saying that he thought the voice would would help to deal with them. But interestingly, the very people who are loudest in support of the voice are the very very people who overrode, overrode the sensible voices, including Ian Trust's, uh, about uh, the grog bans. Uh, they overrode those concerns. And, and this idea that a voice is somehow going to allow decent people like Ian Trust from remote communities to somehow overcome the entrenched leftism of the grievance industry uh, is, is, I'm afraid, very misplaced. Tony, I want to ask you one last question on this topic, and it's, it gets to a broader point, which is about civility mm. in politics. And I'm just reflecting on, you know, Marshall Langdon, mm. La- Marshall Langdon's uh, comments before. It feels to me that uh, politics today is a bit less civil than it used to be. Now, look, maybe I'm looking back in rose-coloured glasses, but look, I'm very interested. You've been at the forefront and a leader in so many debates, whether it's the Republic, whether it's same-sex marriage, whether it's the carbon tax, now with The Voice, you've, for, you know, going on two to three decades, you've been very active in the debate. Um, I just want to interested in your general assessment of, of civility in, in public discourse in Australia today. Well, public discourse in Australia has always been pretty robust. And in the heat of argument, we can often say things which uh, are perhaps a bit over the top. Mm. Normally, when you say something that's over the top, you uh, you, you walk it back. Um, you may you may even apologise. I think that the difference between then and now is that there isn't the same readiness to accept that maybe you did go over the top uh, when, uh, uh, for instance, uh, <laughs> you might liken someone to. Um, a 1930s German leader, for argument's sake, uh, that that was over the top and it wasn't fair. Um, I think too often these sorts of parallels are used today, and 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 they're just left to stand, mm. which is uh, which is a pity. I mean, I can remember calling Kim Beasley a sanctimonious windbag in the Parliament <laughs> one day, and <laughs> I think occasionally he could be, <laughs> but it didn't stop me from constantly saying that Kim Beasley is one of the really outstanding Australian public figures uh, who never never became Prime Minister. And I suspect that the Labor government uh, of 2007 would have been a better government uh, had it been headed by Kim Beasley. Thank you for that, uh, Tony. I'd like to move to our, our second topic, which is based on, a, I think, a very important speech uh, that you gave to the Menzies Research Centre, published uh, in the Australian Enquirer over the weekend. And I just want to give our, our audience the opportunity to hear some of your, your key points because it's quite a significant uh, assessment of the state of the Liberal Party. It's titled, What Would Menzies Do? How to Save um, the Liberal Party? Um, you cover a lot of ground, including the the centrality of the We Believe statement uh, drafted all the way back then when, when Menzies set up the modern Liberal Party. So, Tony, I thought just to give you the floor and, and just give, a I guess, a precis of... Of, of your argument about how to save the Liberal Party? Well, the important thing is to remember what we stand for. Mm. Um, and while uh, policies can change over time as circumstances change, uh, your fundamental instincts and values shouldn't. And back in 1954, Bob Menzies uh, penned a statement, uh, the We Believe statement, he titled it, and it was basically a series of points, 17 points on what we believe. Uh, the first, uh, interestingly, was We Believe in the Crown, mm. uh, which he said was a symbol of unity above and beyond politics uh, and a sign of the unity of the various countries of what he called the British Commonwealth. And then he went on to make a whole lot of very good points. Uh, um, we believe in Australia, um, its strengths, uh, the quality of its people, 
Uh, we be believe in the fundamental freedoms uh, of speech, of worship, uh, of association. Uh, he said, we believe in social justice, but social justice is about uh, encouraging the strong as well as just protecting the weak. Uh, and the point I make is that we have to be grounded in things that endure if we are to respond adequately to the things that pass. Uh, the problems of the day are only going to be responded to effectively if we are conscious of exactly what it is uh, we want to achieve and exactly what are the values that we are trying to realise in the policies of the day. And um, I think it's, it's, it's too easy for uh, people in public life and political parties more generally to become disconnected uh, from the past. And the past should never be your master, but it should always be your teacher. Mm. And this idea that um, the current minister for X, Y or Z is somehow uh, a better articulator and understander of fundamental liberal instincts than the bloke who founded the party uh, and the bloke who led the party for longer than anyone else Frankly, it's pretty arrogant, and that's why I reckon that uh, if we spent more time studying uh, the Menzies legacy, uh, and if we maybe took some concrete steps to remind ourselves uh, of the Menzies legacy, like reciting mm. um, a short version of the We Believe statement at the beginning of every meeting, um, we would be a more grounded political party. And I think if you're more grounded, inevitably you are more effective. Yeah, you know, I think. Now's the time to do it because, I mean, who knows where the New South Wales election will go next year. But if you look at the polls, and polls can be wrong, but if you look at the polls right now, Labor is likely to win there, which means you'll have Labor governments across the mainland of, of Australia and also in, in Canberra. So I think it's fair to say that the centre-right, politically speaking at least, is at a low ebb. And I think you're right that now's the time to have that rejuvenation. Do you think that the Liberal Party as it stands now federally and at the states, has the capacity to rejuvenate? Do you, In terms of, I'm talking the people, the infrastructure, the ideas, what's your assessment? Look, of course it does, Dan. Um, let's go back to, uh, uh, to the end of 2007. Uh, I think that the most senior elected Liberal at that point in time was uh, Campbell Newman, the Lord Mayor of Brisbane. Mm. Uh, we were out of office not just in Canberra but in every single state back then. So... So our position uh, then was worse than it is now and yet uh, in 2010 we reduced a first-term Labor government to minority status and we went back into office in Canberra in 2013 and if I'm not mistaken in 2013 just about every state government uh, was, uh, was, was Liberal too. So, so look, there are... Um, swings and roundabouts, as they say in politics, as in so much else, uh, the Liberal Party can certainly come back. But as I keep saying, you only come back if you are a clear and strong alternative uh, to a, a bad government. And as we discussed on our last podcast, Dan, the difficulty in Victoria was that we weren't distinct enough uh, from the Andrews government. And we didn't really come up with much in the way of policy until the last minute. And when we did, the policy um, was not especially liberal. It was about spending more money on health. Fair enough. Um, but uh, you'd like to think that a liberal opposition would have um, more tiger in its tank than just spending more money on health and spending more money to subsidise public transport fares. I mean, And renewable energy. And, and, and yes, I, I mean, the the... the State coalition's policy on, on on climate and energy was even more green in many respects than that of the Andrews government. And uh, the great con of the Victorian election campaign was uh, the supposed restoration of the State Electricity Commission. Well, the State Electricity Commission was massive brown coal fired power stations, massive brown coal fired power stations that gave Victoria the cheapest energy in the country, perhaps the cheapest energy in the world, and it was the foundation of Victoria uh, as Australia's manufacturing 
Heartland. Dan Andrews isn't bringing that back, for God's sake. <laughs> He's, he just wants more offshore wind farms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's not the SEC. That's a green boondoggle. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah. But no one called it out. No, no. No one. No uh, one. Um, well, it's because there was no alternative, like you say. Mm, yeah. Mm. So, no, Tony, thank you for that. And I wanted to bring that to our listeners' attention. So, if you haven't yet read Tony's speech, you can either go to the Australian website and you'll find it in the Inquirer section or you can go to the Menzies Research Centre website and you'll find the extract of Tony's speech there. I think it's also on the Tony Abbott website On the Tony well. Abbott mm. and that's TonyAbbott.com. Yeah, don't, TonyAbbott.com.au. Excellent. Mm. So, one of those three locations you can, you can access that speech. Uh, Tony, given that this is our last episode of the year, um, I just wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you for uh, continuing with this series. Uh, we've had a lot of positive feedback from our members and listeners. Um, we've all appreciated your guidance, uh, wisdom, advice based on your your experience. Um, you've had a big impact in the media, whether it's talking about national service, whether it's talking about the voice to parliament, whether it's talking about the role of religion in public life. Um, so having someone of your stature and caliber and experience helping guide the center right through, as I say, what is a low ebb, uh, I think has been very useful and, and it's helped, uh, I think, a lot of people through what has been a, a challenging uh, a, a challenging year. So I wanted to thank you for that and also just ask you as we head in and now look forward to 2023, uh, whether you have any thoughts, ideas, suggestions about what you think the big things will be to look out for next year. Yeah, well, Dan, look, um, and and I, I, I mean, I I know not everyone who listens to these podcasts is a uh, rusted on supporter of the Liberal National Coalition. Um, I'm obviously uh, very much a partisan for the Liberal National Coalition. I sometimes wish that we were more this or more that, or less this or less that. But look, in the end, I absolutely want uh, the Liberal National Coalition. Uh, to do as well as it can everywhere. And and I guess uh, I, I would most want to discourage any defeatism in our ranks. Uh, yes, we uh, sometimes are defeated, but defeat should never lead to defeatism because uh, you can always come back and the challenge is to come back better than before. And I certainly want the next coalition government in Canberra to be better than the last one. And I believe not only can it be better than the last one, but I think we can get one sooner than people currently think. I mean, the latest polls, uh, unsurprisingly, are pretty good for the Albanese government. Uh, You'd expect uh, a government that's uh, been there for less than a year um, and has had some political successes to, uh, to be riding reasonably high. But, but um, there is absolutely no doubt uh, that government policies are making a bad situation worse when it comes to energy prices. Uh, the most concrete uh, promise that the government made uh, pre-election was to cut household energy bills by $275 a year. Uh, that promise is going to be massively broken and it's going to be government policy, which is to blame. Uh, so far from... Uh, cutting prices, uh, government actions are going to dramatically raise prices. And I think that these chickens are going to start coming home to roost mm. um, in the in the new year. I would be very surprised if uh, come uh, the middle of 2025, we don't have uh, um, a pretty dire situation, uh, not so different from the current energy si- si- situation in Europe uh, with the coal-fired power stations closing, um, with intermittent renewable power uh, unable to give us the 24-7 power uh, that we need. I also think that there's a further problem uh, which is going to be building up uh, over the next couple of years. Um, um, the, the fiscal position, the budgetary position, is absolutely dependent upon mm. the revenues that the federal government gets from coal and gas royalties, okay. and yet the government is doing everything it can to stop new coal and gas discoveries and new coal and gas developments. So how are we going to fund all of these extra social spending, spendings like the NDIS, uh, if at the same time um, we are sabotaging um, 
the goose that has laid this golden egg over and over again for our country. So, so I think that um, provided the coalition can come up with clear alternative policies, and there are some reasonably encouraging signs, uh, um, we can be very, very competitive at the next election. Now, um, obviously, uh, we shouldn't be allowing coal-fired power stations to close uh, until we have a uh, an obvious dispatchable alternative. Uh, plainly, if we are going to achieve net zero uh, and keep the lights on, we've got to look at nuclear power, which is the only form of emissions-free dispatchable power that is currently well and truly proven. And... Uh, that seems to be the direction that the coalition is 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 moving in. So, look, um, I've got uh, uh, a degree of of guarded optimism, if you like, <laughs> for uh, for the future, and uh, I'm a big fan of Peter Dutton, who I think is absolutely the right person to be leading the coalition in Canberra. Very decent human being, uh, shown consistently in his time as a minister. Uh, that he can make tough decisions and carry an argument for them. So uh, <laughs> I just say to people, don't be discouraged, uh, provided we uh, keep the faith and fight the good fight, the future can be better, much better. Tony, a great note to end on. Again, thank you for your contributions this year and looking forward to what the new year brings. Thanks, Dan. This is a production of the Centre for the Australian Way of Life at the Institute of Public Affairs. To find out more, visit australia.ipa.org.au.